Hello, uh, Bev and Etienne. Thank you so much for being here with me. Hi, Miriam. Hi. Hello, Good to Miriam. See you. Hello. Um, yeah, so the first thing I just kind of want to mention, like as part of the Learning and Development Accelerator, we really want to take a, what we call a research aligned approach to uh, practice in learning and development and learning and development is quite broad uh, in that space. And, and one of the things that we think is really important in that context is that we stand on shoulders of giants. Um, so a long story short, we definitely think that you two are two of the giants. Um, so I really appreciate the time. Uh, let me first introduce you brief briefly before we uh, kick off our conversation. So A. Chen, um, you are very well known for your work uh, on communities of practice, um, of course, and then also the book on situated uh, learning as well. And the Digital Habitats book with Nancy White and John Smith. And you are one of the most cited uh, authors in the social science, and so I, so I believe. And Bev, you are known for your work uh, with international organizations and the use of new uh, technologies. Your expertise is very much in designing and facilitating uh, social learning strategies and also coaching of social learning leaders in complex situations. And from what I've understood is that you're very much an activist uh, at heart. <laughs> is there anything I've forgotten that you think is important to, to mention and for our audience to know about you? Well, I think it might be good to say that we are both theorists and practitioners. For sure. We use our practice to develop our theories and, and our theories to inform our practice. So this is very much the way that we, that we function. Yeah, that's, that's very good. That's very good for our participants to know, I think, um, about both of you. Bev, anything you would like to add? Uh, no, that's, that's, that's all. <laughs> okay, great. So um, the, the theme here for, for this conversation today is, you know, what, according to you, is the one thing that L&D practitioners should be aware of, the, the one part of research that, that practitioners should be aware of? So what would that be, according to both of you? Well, I mean, knows? if there is one thing that we we would like them to remember out of this conversation is this distinction we are making in our, in our work between learning as a transmission of certainty and learning as the mutual engagement of uncertainty. And that is a profound theoretical difference with a lot of practical implications. And we don't say that learning is never the transmission of certainty, but traditionally people view learning. When you say learning, people think, oh, somebody knows and they transmit their certainty to someone who doesn't. Usually people don't think of learning as this mutual engagement of, oh, you, we don't know how to do this. What do you think, et cetera, you know? So, so we, we want people to have the distinction in mind because we think it's very, very important, especially for learning and development uh, uh, people because they have learning in the in their um yeah exactly and that, that that's a huge difference right so before we dive into that like to, to better understand what that means i just want to talk a bit about communities of practice because you know as i said in the intro you've written a lot of, on communities of practice and they're also widely used um in organizations but i'm not sure if the term is always used the right way because the focus is very much on sharing. So before we move on to discuss around what you were saying around the engagement of mutual uncertainty, like could you first define communities of practice a bit for me? Actually, I, I want to make a bridge between the last thing that Etienne said and what you're now bringing up about communities of practice, which is really about learning being 
You see, traditionally, people see learning as something separate. We do learning in that classroom or we do learning over there. So learning somehow happens somewhere. Right? Yeah. But learning as an experience of being a human being in the world, right? learning as being this rather humble person in the world who doesn't quite know how to do any everything right, yeah, that's what we're talking about as learning, right? And that's it. Still, that part that, that drives a lot of our theorizing, and then that's also that brings us to community of practice because people often think of community of practice now as something out there, something separate. But community of practice are an integral part of who we are, whether or not we call it. Exactly. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. So yeah. now we we kind of like find those structures to organize them without realizing that they're already there. They're already there and they are, the important thing is that they are meaningful to who we are. They are part of our trajectory as human beings, learning to be people in the world, learning to survive as a species. So it is just part of who we are and not something separate. Learning is not something separate. Community of practice are not something separate. So that just just as a sort of background or preface to what is a community of practice. And then perhaps we can say a community of practice is a special social structure where this process of mutual engagement happens around a practice that people share. Mm -hmm. Now, it can happen around other things, but in a community of practice, people share a practice, whether that practice is a professional practice like how to open people's uh, chest to change their heart or whatever, mm -hmm. all the way to how to be a, a member of a street gang and how to, how to deal drugs and not be killed. You know, all these are practices and there are communities that sustain those practices by forming a learning partnership around the practice. So this is for us what we would call a committee of practice. Okay, so the practice can be anything, but it's still about improving that practice, right? So, so yeah. for me, that goes beyond. So I, because I feel that in organizations, in addition to you know what Beth was just saying, that it the focus is very much on the the formal structuring of things, that it's also very much about sh just sharing without really considering how to actually improve the practice, which to me are two completely right. different right. things. So mm -hmm. communities of practice are not about sharing. Okay, so mm -hmm. what are they, I mean, what, what does that mean? Like, they are about, I mean, you may share in the, because you see when you were, um, you know, it, it, when you were cavemen going out for a bison, it might be good to share who's going to do what and what kind of knife you're using, especially when there's a lot of bison about to catch. But if there aren't many bison, then you may, you may be very competitive. You may not share in order to survive. You don't share. So it's not about sharing per se. It's about learning to get better. You're sharing in order to. You're not just sharing for any old thing or you're competing in order to get better at doing what you're doing. So sharing is never a goal in itself. But it often, I mean... In, so when um, you were saying, because... I was just going to say, in traditional societies where people, you know, people often, uh, in my master's degree, actually, we studied cooperatives in, in development studies. And we looked at um, cooperatives in, in countries in Africa where people really cooperate in order to sell their goods in order to make stuff. And people really romanticized in those days, that was many years ago, cooperation in the same way now as people romanticize a little bit sharing. But people cooperated because in order to survive when you're in hard conditions, you, you survive much better if you cooperate. If you do everything on your own, you die, frankly. You don't get enough wood for your fire, right? You don't battle successfully against the encroaching desert. Right? You don't. So you cooperate in order to survive. 
So yes, people were cooperating, but there's always in order to survive, not just because cooperating is a nice, a nice thing to do. Nice, nice and then thing. in a way, sharing, yeah, sorry, sharing has taken on this same often, often, especially in community of practice speak, has become a little bit of a sort of an ideology as if sharing was the end goal. Sharing is not the exactly, end goal. Exactly, yeah. I think that's yeah. the key difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The competence, you see, developing the competence is, is the goal. Okay. Goal. And the competence is to make a difference. So in an organization, think of an organization, in order to achieve their mission or in order to remain competitive, like to, to pick up on Bev, a, a notion of survival, in order to be competitive in the market, if you are, if you are a for-profit, or to achieve your mission if you're a non-profit, you need some competence. You need people who are world-class at doing the work that they do. And this is why you need a committee of practice. Because as Beb was saying, you cannot be world-class by yourself. You need, you need others to bounce things off. And sometimes it looks like sharing, but if you had a community of practice and we sit around the table, who wants to share? Yeah. <laughs> that goes nowhere, you know? But, but, but if you have a community of practice that says, our competitors have just developed this new way of doing things. What do we do? You know? Yeah, so now we go back to the, the, the engagement of mutual uncertainty, right? Things mm -hmm. are not clear. We, are, we need to figure it out together. Yeah. So when you were saying that at the beginning, were you referring to communities of practice at all? What do you mean? In so... The yeah, I mean, there is communities of practice are also sharing this mutual uncertainty, but more in our recent book, we have developed this idea of a social learning space, which is a social learning space is where, because what we have noticed is that you can actually even have smaller conversations, whether it's around the family dinner table, whether it's on a plane talking to somebody, whether it's in a team meeting, there are sometimes those moments where you feel like, wow, we are all trying to make a difference and we recognize each other as people who want to make a difference. And in talking to you, I can understand better how to approach my own, um, my own practice in pursuit of making that difference. And not because you know the answer, but because you and I, in our engagement and in our conversation, you know, by engaging our uncertainty, we can make progress in our own practice. And so we've now talking about social learning spaces, which may or may not be a community of practice, but you don't have to be a full blown community of practice developing a competence in order to be a social learning space. But both of them have at their core, this mutual engagement of uncertainty. Yeah, so now you're talking about your, your new book, right? Learning mm -hmm. uh, to make a difference. So why did you feel the need to, to write this book? Why is this an important book? I mean, I loved it, but I just want to hear from you, think, like think, why, that, why you think it's important. I think there are two reasons. One is that we saw that people use the term community of practice often for things that we would say, no, but this is not a community of practice. But still, there was an interest, like, like we went to a conference and they said, uh, in the program, they said, from four to five today, we will have a community of practice. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. no, that's not a community of practice. But we could see what they mean. They, they didn't have a word for it, but they mean that kind of engagement, that's kind of peer-to-peer -peer partnership, right? And so we created the term community uh, social learning space so that people could talk about that form of engagement, which often happens in a committee of practice, but not in a committee of practice. So people would not be stuck with the term committee of practice for everything. You know? And so we felt that need to, to add a term to the theory. And the second thing, the second reason we wrote the book is that we feel that there is not enough rigor about thinking about learning as learning to make a difference and therefore thinking about the value that learning has for participants who want to make a difference. And so we felt that we needed to talk about the value of learning in more rigorous way. 
So what does that mean in practice to focus on value? I know that's quite a broad question. Um, no, but, but I'm just trying to think when you think about the framework in the book, like where, yeah, how do you figure out as a group of people who try to make a difference, where do you start? Like, uh, how, how do you think about value? But maybe we should go back a little bit, but to say, okay, when you look at people who, who, who are leading communities, sometimes they are evaluated on things like how many members do you have and mm. how often do you meet and and how many posts are there on the website? You know, or even the, people people assume if you're sharing, you're creating value. Yes, that's yeah. yes. Yeah. So there are all sorts of assumptions around it. Yeah, like how many people share? Yeah, how much do you share? But mm -hmm. like who who is putting up a page on the wiki or something? You know, right? so we thought these are superficial features because in the end, what makes a community live or die? Is, is it creating value for the members? Do, you, do members feel that for one hour they invest in the community, they get a lot of value, they get more value than one hour worth? You know what I mean? And, like, and value not in the sense of I enjoyed it, but value in the sense that I took something from this that I am able to use in my practice that will actually help me to make a difference that I care about. And so, it's that flow of value from engaging in an activity to making a difference that you care about. Because it's not just simply the value of sitting around talking to friends and, and feeling good, although that's good in itself. That of course, is yeah. yeah. Um, but we wanted to well, give value to all, to different kinds of value, but really the difference or the learning that we're talking about is the learning that is going to make a difference, where people care to make a difference. I, I, I kind of keep hearing, you know, that organizational response like, oh, this is way too formal and we don't have time for all this. Um, it's always interesting to me in the sense that people think it's okay to make a lot of assumptions and potentially waste a lot of time. But then when you need to invest, some time to get something really good out of it, then people seem to push back. So what is your experience in working with organizations just kind of shift to a more value-focused approach? Our, our well, experience think... is that they love it, basically. You know, the, 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 the people we've worked with so far, they love this idea to, okay, we, we think of a community of practice as an investment and there is a return investment of time, you know, it's not just all about money, but it's in, in, in a non-profit, it can be just an investment of time in trying to improve things. And then we look, is it really improving? And, you know, it's not just the organization that loves that kind of rigor. It's also the members themselves, mm. you know, because in a committee of practice, it's really important to say, okay, what value did you get out of the conversation we had a month ago? And the person says, oh, I thought it was a really great idea and I tried to do this and it didn't work, but I tried to do that and it really worked. So when you bring the value back into the learning of the community, it really, it really kind of like uh, um, charges the learning. You see what I mean? So to think I would of, say, yeah, I would say yeah. that often people say they don't get value or this is, takes too much time is because their experience of community practice, and I'm going to be frank here, is very often that they go to monthly meetings, which are webinars or something, and somebody comes in and talks and everyone goes home. So it becomes, yeah, it becomes an investment of time, but without ever actually talking about practice or engaging uncertainty, engaging, what is it? I don't know, you know, I've got a problem here. Can anybody help me? In fact, lots of people feel quite happy to invest a lot of time in preparing a conference or an event. And people would go. They go because they get the budget to go. Um, they get all sorts of credit points for going to this session or that session. But actually, the value they get is from the coffee break where they're talking something. But yeah, how did you do that? Oh, you did it. Oh, oh, oh. All right. And where people feel like they have the real conversations. And so all it is is we're saying, let's harness 
those conversations where people really talk about the dirty business of practice. And when you start talking about the dirty business of practice, that it's hard, that it's challenging, that I can be frank with you because I know you're not going to see me as stupid, where I feel like, wow, I've come away with that, wow, with some good practical ideas as to what to do. And when it doesn't work, I can still come back to the same group and say, hey guys, but this hasn't quite worked for me. And they'll come up with some further ideas. But it's still about the, the capturing it somehow as well, right? So how do you go about that? Because you also don't want to spend like hours and hours just cap capturing. So where is the... I mean, capturing, there can be capturing, right? But our focus on value is not about capturing. Our focus on value is about sharpening the rigor with which you see how what you do can make a difference. Mm. Because you see, in a team, you make a difference by doing, doing the project on target, within budget, on time, everything. So in a team, the difference that you make is often within the team, usually. Yes. But in a community of practice, the difference is never in a community of practice. The difference is in the practice. You see, and so we need to be somewhat rigorous to see how does a community of practice make a difference in the way that people do things. You see, because it's not happening there. You see, the purpose of a community of practice is never to be a community of practice. The purpose of community of practice is to improve practice. I actually think that people overlook that fact. I actually, now that you mentioned that, this might sound really silly, but I think that people in organizations often experience that coming together in the space is where the value happens, which in reality, what you're saying is no, the value is in bringing it back to practice yeah. and, and improving the practice. That's right. Outside. That's exactly right. And on, yeah, on a pr very practical level, it's like very often in community practice, they say, oh, we, if our membership goes up from like, I don't know, 20 to 100, whoa, we've done well, or 100 to 1,000, wow, we must have done well, because we're improving our community of practice. But right. we'd say, but hang on, has anything changed in practice? And if you've got 10 people and massive change in practice, that's much better than having 100 members and no change in practice. 100 members sitting around having a good conversation. Yeah, that's great. But unless you see a change in practice, you know, where's the value? So it's not about improving your community of practice. It's about improving your practice. Yeah. The devil is in the detail. <laughs> <laughs> so what as L&D could we do or should we do differently to actually facilitate and empower those social learning spaces? I think, to me, one of the things that learning and development people really need to see is that a community of practice can merge professional development and practice improvement. Very often those things are viewed as two separate things. Okay? So you have learning and development people in HR and you have, mm -hmm. I don't know, knowledge management or whatever in, 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 in a technical uh, 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 um, department. But in fact, the best way to, to do professional development is to engage practitioners in developing the practice. You know? And so I think, I think learning and development people have to stop thinking about development as something that happens outside when people go to training and outside and practice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's about when, when, when practitioners come together and they reflect on, okay, what's working? What's not working? How can we do something better? Why do our competitors do this so much better than us? And so on and so forth. They do professional development also. So for us, I think we would love to see the field of learning and development understand that professional development is part of developing practice. I don't know if this makes sense to you, but for us, it, it's, really, it's really important. 
even though these things are often in different departments in organization. It makes total sense to me. Beth, do you have any last recommendations for us practitioners? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it would be uh, really like as a first one, two, three steps. The first one is really getting to grips with what is it that keeps people up at night? All right, so professional development is about, and as Etienne said, if it's developing the practice, then the best place to hear that is from the practitioners and what they are experiencing in, pra in practice, not the research that was done, although the research would be important to pull in at some point, but to start with what are the challenges that people have in practice and what could we do together to address those challenges which we couldn't do alone and to let go of the thought of having to bring in some specialist immediately you know bring a specialist in when you've got or an expert in when you've um, got the practitioners saying oh yeah now what would we when they pull it in so yeah I, I would say What is it that keeps people up at night? And what could we do together? Facilitating a space, which is whereby, what can we do together in order to address this? Thank you both so much. Uh, again, I really appreciate your time. And I really hope that um, people in L&D will look beyond you know, the formal learning interventions as we're so used to and really focus on facilitating and empowering people uh, in practice. Thank you so much. Very good, yeah. Thank you, Miriam. Thanks, Miriam.